Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. The week, again, was exciting. So many things to talk about. I'm not going to have enough time. Uh, I hope to take us this evening to uh, Charlottesville, the moon, Washington, Key West, Texas, Russia, Whitefish, Montana, Navarra, Italy, and Paris. Let's see what we can do. I'm not going to be into Trump too much tonight because we know all about Trump. We see him all day on the television set. We read about him in the newspapers. We read about him on the Internet. So you don't need me to tell you about Donald, except where I disagree with him, which sometimes is in quite a few places. I want to start in Charlottesville. Do you remember the rally that took place on August 12, 2017? Uh, it was the situation where you had the Ku Klux Klan, the white na- the um, white nationalists, and uh, other uh, neo Nazis. And then you had the good people across the street. I'm laughing the way I say the good people, but it's true, uh, who were there to oppose these people. So you had two groups coming down there, the ultra-ultra-right and everyone else on the other side of the street. And tempers were rising. This, This rally, by the way, this march, was for purposes of one of the white nationalistic groups, the United, Unite the Right rally it was called it was unite the right and it was the unite the right rally things got out of hand a bit there was some punching around hitting people some stones uh some tear gas uh, people yelling at each other and things would settle down then they pick up again well this is so we can put it in perspective the rally where trump said that both sides were to blame, the good people and the bad people is the way I'm going to put it, the white nationalists on one side, Ku Klux Klan, Nazi group, and then the rest of the people on the other side. This was the first time we had an indication in this country, a true indication that our president was a racist, okay? So here's what happened. You recall that at some point uh, a fellow by the name of, what's his name here, James Alex Fields, Jr., James Alex Fields, Jr., 22 years old, uh, was driving his car down the street towards uh, one. He belonged, by the way, to the white nationalists, the white supremacists, Uh, drove his car towards the other group and stopped, backed up, and then hit that gas pedal and drove his car right into that crowd of people, killing another 22-year-old, Heather Heyer killed her immediately. Well, justice is in the pro- it has been complete in this case now. Here's what's been happening. He was charged with murder in state court and in federal court. He first appeared at a trial in December in state court. He was convicted, obviously, um, because they charged him with the death of Heather Heyer. And he was sentenced by the state court judge to life with no opportunity for parole. Pretty tough, going to die in jail. But he still had federal charges pending against him uh, for terrorism, uh, harassment, things like that. Terrorism was the big charge in federal court. Well, this came up in March, this past March. And no sense in him having another trial. He already blew it in state court. Even if he won in federal court, he's going away for life with no opportunity for parole. So he pled guilty to the terrorism, et cetera, charges in federal court. He was just sentenced this past week. What a sentence the federal judge gave him. He he gave him life imprisonment plus 419 years, 419 years. All the crime, he was charged with multiple crimes in federal court. Uh, Because we have more laws in federal court applying to situations of this nature. So here's a guy gets life in 419 years. He ain't ever going to see the outside of that jail, and that's justice. A 22-year-old girl is dead. Her family suffers. She had a boyfriend. He suffers. Her friends suffer. Uh, She'll never know the joys of life because he decided he wanted to hurt somebody that day. Moving on now. 
This is Apollo 11 week. Apollo 11 week. Apollo 11 was the first uh, the first uh, spaceship, our spaceship, to reach the moon and to put men on the moon. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. This was a big deal, and it still would be a big deal. Uh, we've only sent two ships to the moon. There have been some other men on the moon whose names I can't recall. Uh, but can you imagine? I've, I, in my lifetime, I have been impressed with two things. Man walking on the moon. When Neil Armstrong put his foot down, blew my mind. Inconceivable. Inconceivable. This was 1969. Even today, if it hadn't happened yet, inconceivable that we could fly to the moon and men would walk on the moon. And the other thing that blew my mind in my lifetime, I've seen a lot in 84 years, was the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was 1990 or 91. I never thought that wall was going to come down. It went up after World War II, and it didn't budge. And it separated East and West Germany. And it represented starkly the conflict between the United States and Soviet Russia. So when that thing came down, the people got upset, and they knocked it down. Very, very impressive. You have to understand, we lived in fear of war. As our children in school today are being trained what to do if someone has a gun uh, within the school or on campus, they're, they're taught how to, whatever they have to do. We were taught, our children were taught uh, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s what to do. They were to get on their hands and knees under their desk. Can you imagine a, an atomic bomb, because that's what they were then, dropping on in an area near your school. Now you say, well, why'd you worry about it? Well, I lived in Utica, New York, and 14 miles from us was a SAC air base. SAC, there are only six in the country. Uh, SAC is where the B-52s were stationed. They were the airplanes that would carry nuclear weapons to our enemy, probably Soviet Russia at the time. So if the Soviets wanted to hit us first, they're going to hit the SAC bases. Ours was only 14 miles away. Had to destroy my town completely. So we lived in fear of war back then. It's not like that today, even though I think war could happen easier today. We were in fear of war. Anyhow, so now they went on the moon. Uh, Neil Armstrong and Bud Aldrin. It's a little after 11 o'clock. We're home in Utica, New York, my wife and I in the family room, and we are watching... You know, we saw we saw the, the, the ship land. We saw uh, Neil Armstrong was getting ready to walk down the steps. I told my wife, I'm going to wake up the kids. They got to see this. This is history in the making. Uh, my children were 5 to 10 years old at the time, four of them. I rushed upstairs, woke them all up, said, follow me. They came downstairs. They sat on the floor in front of the TV set. They couldn't keep their eyes open. They're, on, again, only 5 to 10 years old, the four of them. And I explained to them very rapidly, this is history. You will never forget this. Man is walking on the moon, et cetera, et cetera. And I wanted them to always remember it. Sometimes during our family gatherings this day, one of them or me will bring up this episode of what Dad did the night that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Because, my friends, not one of them remember it. <laughs> Not one of my children remember that great evening, and it was a great evening. It was a compliment to us. It was a compliment to what President Kennedy had started. Now, if we go to the moon again, if we go to Mars, it's going to be a long time before you see a human being taking a ship there. The word is, from what I understand, that it will be robots that will be our space explorers, not humans. It, there either will be no more Neil Armstrongs or it will be a very long time before there is a, another Neil Armstrong. Which brings me now to President Carter. President Carter is a nice guy, Jimmy Carter. He came out of nowhere to become president. He was a peanut farmer in Georgia, I think, or Alabama. And he was governor down there. No one even knew him. He decided he wanted to run for president, and he won. Uh, he was only a one-term president. He probably was the worst president of our modern era. I've got to say that. Uh, not that he was a bad guy. He just 
he didn't have good luck. Everything he did got screwed up someplace. It was like the black cloud was always following him. Anyhow, during uh, his term, we had a tremendous oil crisis. We haven't had one since. The last time we had an oil crisis here, the gasoline cost more than $4 a gallon. Back then, it was probably in the late 1970s, there was no gasoline to put in the car. That was the problem. The tanks were empty. The pumps were empty. We didn't have enough heating fuel. It was disastrous. And we couldn't get it. The whole world was screwed up. I think Saudi Arabia and the, uh, the Arab groups that were controlling oil at the time were doing this to raise the price. But we, we were taking a screwing big time. That's why he wasn't a good president. Everything bad happened on it during his uh, presidency. Anyhow, Carter made a speech, big speech. It was announced, and this was on February 2nd, 1977. He was going to make a speech about the oil crisis. Tonight on television, we all watched. We all waited and watched. What was he going to tell us? Hopefully he would have some resolution to what what was a terrible problem. I once waited in line in Pompano Beach, Florida for three hours to reach the pump. I was afraid there wasn't even going to be any more gas there when I got there to get, get, get some gasoline. And then you were limited, five gallons and so forth. And heating fuel, good luck. <laughs> Don't abuse it. Don't use it too much. Well, here's what Carter had to say. He was going to solve our problem. And it, this, this contributed to his being thought of as a poor president. I hate to say it that way, but it's true. He says, turn the thermostat down to 60 degrees, day and night, 60 degrees, and wear a sweater. And while he was making the speech, he wore a sweater, no jacket. He had a tie on and shirt, but he had a cardigan uh, button, button-up button sweater uh, on him. He says, you've got to wear a sweater to keep warm, and you've got to lower your thermostat so you don't burn as much fuel oil. Well, on February 2nd, 1977, that's the middle of winter in Utica, New York. I, I, I'm in the middle of New York State. I'm 240 miles north of New York City. It's cold. We had evenings 10, 20 degrees below zero. Zero and 10 and 20 above were warm, but you still froze your asses. I'm going to tell you right now, it was cold. And you want us to put the heat at 60 degrees? My God, it, it was ridiculous. So you can see how this poor guy, he, everything he did, he tried. It didn't work out right. Uh, he's the best president that we've ever had post-presidency. Since he has left the White House, he has done so much good in this world. He has done more than any other former president in his afterlife as a non-president. Uh, he, he has gone with uh, building groups. I forget what they're called. He and his wife go all over the world building houses for poor people. When there are special elections in some foreign nation, nations, a nation, foreign nation, where there's uh, a contest and somebody may cheat and so forth. He goes there and he monitors the election. This is all for nothing. This is the kind of guy he is. And I'll tell you this too. He comes down here generally New Year's Eve, not to Key West itself. To some, he comes into Key West, but Summerlin Key, which is 22 miles north of us here in Key West, on US one. Summerlin Key. Uh, he comes down there. He has a friend there, and he spends New Year's Eve with him every year on the open ocean. Good guy, wonderful guy, lousy president. Douche bank. You've heard of douche bank in the last year or two. Uh, this supposedly, it hasn't been proven yet any place, supposedly is the bank that financed Trump after American banks wouldn't give him any more money because he put him into bankruptcy uh, with the Atlantic City properties. And Douche Bank's headquarters is over there in Germany, and it's in Turkey. They're big over in Turkey and Germany. Uh, now, what's the problem? Douche Bank is in trouble financially. Uh, you don't hear that about many banks or any banks today, but Douche Bank is in trouble. And the reason they're in trouble is they've been screwing around. For several years, they've been doing dishonest things. There's a lot of money laundering involved here. Uh, and things like that, and they made crazy type loans, and they've been Trump's, Trump and his family's primary source of dollars. 
their their bank. Uh, and we haven't heard anything on this yet. Got to get his tax returns and everything else to see if there's a connection with the Trump family. Anyhow, because of their uh, poor reputation, et cetera, it all catches up with you. They're not doing as well as they used to do. So it was announced two weeks ago that they were going into restructuring. They had a restructure. And they were going to lay off 18,000 employees, 18,000 employees. They announced it on a Friday, a week ago Friday. Uh, They announced it on a Friday morning and said, we are already laying off some of our Asia employees. Monday morning, this is a week ago Monday, Monday morning, they were at the Douche Bank at 60 Wall Street, New York City. By by 9.15, there were more people walking out of the bank than going in. It was reported in one of the newspapers that in the first half hour, the bank was open. Five people would walk out of the bank contrasted with one person walking in, which means all or most of the five people walking out had been people that were laid off. Because when you're laid off, you're gone immediately in these type of situations. Uh, so that's the way that went. Now, they're in, I'll tell you how bad the shape is that they're in. Douche Bank says that even with the restructuring that they're doing, and they're taking drastic means to do it, 18,000 employees a lot, and they're probably going to have more going down the tubes, it still will result in a projected net loss of $8.3 billion in 2020. In other words, they can't get rid of all their debt. Their restructuring is restructuring is merely bringing their debt down to $8.3 billion, and it won't be down to that level till 2002. Okay, I want to talk about something that's very close to my heart, and if you lived in Key West, it would be very close to your heart, and if you don't live in Key West, have never visited here, come down some year for Hemingway Days, Ernest Hemingway Days. Ernest Hemingway lived here for 10, 11 years. This is, he and Harry Truman spent a lot of time here. Tennessee Williams is their city. We're proud of these people, uh, that they came and they stayed for a while. Anyhow, Hemingway Days is once a year, and it starts tomorrow, Wednesday, and it concludes Sunday. It's the 39th anniversary of Hemingway Days. It's headquarters at world-famous Sloppy Joe's. I mean, these names got to, must excite you. Uh, and it, it's the same festival every year. I mean, they have a, a marathon, a 5 or 15K, I don't know. I don't run. Uh, they have all kinds of parties, dancing, band in the street. It, it's a wonderful event, daytime, nighttime. And, and it's a family-type event, too. Uh, and you get families down here. The two events that I like the most over these days are the running of the bulls, and the Hemingway Lookalike Contest. The Running of the Bulls. Remember, I forget which book it was that Hemingway wrote. He was over in Spain, and he watched The Running of the Bulls. Well, it's become a tradition here. We have The Running of the Bulls. I don't know, we got 20, 30 bulls. They're not real bulls. They're big. They're made of plywood, cardboard. They're on wheels. They look like bulls, not real ones. But those are our built bulls. And we also have Hemingways. Ernest Hemingway is here. We will have in excess of 150 Hemingways here. It is a contest every year. It's called the Hemingway Lookalike Contest. 150 men with white beards are going to come down here. They're a little potty. They'll be wearing the same attire, all of them, uh, red cap, uh, white shirt, red bandana, holding up their white pants. And one of them will be selected as the Hemingway Lookalike for the year. This is a great honor. These guys come down here because it's a great honor. They all want to be the Hemingway lookalike. And it takes an average of at least 10 years to make the grade. You've got to come down and keep coming back, get to know people and so forth. I ran in last week, last week I ran in the chart room. I, ran in, I can't remember this gentleman's name, uh, but I've known him the last several years. He comes down for the Hemingway lookalike contest. And he looks like Hemingway. And he participates in the Hemingway Lookalike Contest every year. And this is his 26th consecutive year that he is participating. And he said, Lewis, 
this is the year. <laughs> Sounded like Mel Fisher, this is the day. But that's the enthusiasm that goes with it. It's a wonderful event. It's exciting. That's all I can tell you. It is exciting. I have a very sad story to share with you. Maybe I don't understand what goes on in this world sometimes, but this is strange and this is a little bit heavy. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you now about a Texas court, a six-year-old boy, and a mother and father who are going through a divorce proceeding. Uh, the mother and father obviously don't get along. The, they have a son, six years old. Jeff's his name. The mother says Jeff is transsexual. And even though he is body-wise a male, he has a penis, in reality he is a girl. So she has raised him as a girl. She dresses him like a girl. She sends him to school like a girl. No one in the school, including the school administration, knows he is a boy. No one knows a boy. She has kept this absolutely secret. She moved to another area, another town. And she says, I'm doing this because it's good for my son. I wonder if she's doing it despite her husband. But anyhow, it's good for my son. This is where his mind is. This is what he should be, and this is what he will be. He will be a woman because that is what he is. Well, she's already got this thing planned out. He's six years old. He's in the first grade. She says that when he's eight years old, she's going to have him castrated. You heard me. It's going to be a chemical castration. Still gets rid of the penis because this is going to be one of the steps to bringing him along so his body can be as his mind is, as she claims. I mean, eventually he'll probably have a sex operation, so uh, they'll put female sex organs down there. But can you imagine, eight years old, she's going to have him castrated. It appears the judge thinks this is a good idea. Her proof must be great that this kid is really female, not male. Uh, the judge has given custody of the child to the mother, and she continues to do what she has been doing. The father opposes the castration and the, this changing of his sex, as he puts it. He says he's a boy, he's a man, and he acts like a man. And what happens is when little James, little Jeff, rather, is with his father, he is a boy. He acts like a boy. He's happy to be a boy. When he's with his mother, he's a girl. He's happy to be a girl. He tries to accommodate uh, from what I read, both parents by doing that. Anyhow, I just wanted to share this with you, and the court's inclined to go with the castration the, the article indicated. Uh, I don't know. To me, it's legalized child abuse at that age. Which now brings us to... I'm going to talk about Donald Trump. How's that? I finally reached Trump. Uh, he, he, big day today for Donald at about 7 o'clock tonight, uh, the United States House of Representatives voted to condemn him. He was held in condemnation uh, because he treated four young ladies, four new female congresspeople, uh, as people of color. And they are people of color. But he insulted them. He said that they should go back from where they came. Now, this, you know, we've got some, uh, you can call them rebels, revolutionaries. They're just young people who got elected to the United States Congress, and they want to do something. They want to see our government change, not the way Trump is changing it, but in a better fashion. And, of course, they're opposed to just about everything Donald Trump does. Well, when Trump came on, all these humanity, all these things he's doing at the southern border, they're upset with. Some of them went down there. They saw how awful it was, and they came back, and they were yelling and screaming on TV, and properly so. Uh, and so they said Trump is a racist. They didn't say Trump was a racist. They indicated that he was doing evil. They, this racism didn't come up yet. Trump didn't hesitate. He immediately sent out a tweet, and he said, he said, and he said this again the next morning at a conference, press conference outside on the lawn at the White House. If these four women don't like this country, they should go back where they came from. Well, it just so happens three of them came from the United States. They were born here. And the fourth was born in Somalia, but at 14 she became a naturalized citizen. 
So he doesn't back off. You know how Trump is. He never backs off, and he keeps saying, hey, this isn't racism. This is just the way it is. If they don't like it here, get out. And these women, these four new female congressmen, the young people, they took it as an affront. A lot of people took it as an affront, Republicans also. And tonight, for the second time in the history of the United States, the United States House of Representatives held in condemnation the President of the United States for what they considered words of racism, that these girls should go, these ladies should go back from whence they came. By the way, this whole thing arose off over that $4.5 billion bill that was passed about six days ago to provide uh, humanitarian things for people, at the migrants at the southern border. Uh, you know, food, water, you don't have to drink out of a toilet, a mattress to sleep on or a bed, blankets, uh, medical care, showers, brush your teeth, toothpaste, the basics. And they wanted to make sure these girls, they didn't think it was right to give the money to the government because they felt Trump would misuse it and use it to try to build a wall or bring more soldiers down there or more ICE people. So they voted against it. They were opposed to it. Uh, they didn't have much of a following on the vote, but this was their position. And because of that, that's how this whole thing got started. And Donald threw a racist statement at them. We know Trump is a bigot. I say it unequivocally. And if you don't know it, something's wrong, open your eyes, open your ears, hear what he says, see how he says it. The man has been a bigot from day one. So that's the story with these four ladies, and it works in opposition to Trump's position this time, because I think this voter condemnation is going to affect some people. Uh, you say, well, what difference does it make? Well, you don't want bad marks on your report card. And every president has a report card that follows him in history. Uh, so that's the story there. We shall see what happens. I'm sure Trump's going to have more to say on this issue tomorrow. I say I hope the Democrats as a group stand up more and more openly and bring the fight to Trump. It has to be done. Our country is at stake. The way we live is at stake. I'm not trying to be dramatic. And I know 50% of the people in this country are racist, are bigots too. Uh, they believe in white supremacy and everything else because that's the way it is. And Trump wasn't a genius that he got into this. He didn't create the, the, the situation with racism and bigotry today. It was there before he ran for president. He spotted it, though, and he took advantage of it. Smart man in that regard. I want to talk quickly about uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, senator for years, uh, John McCain's best friend. They always seem to support the same thing, generally, and they were always together, buddies. Buddies, now since McCain's gone, Lindsey Graham has become the asshole buddy of Donald Trump. He goes to Mar-a-Lago to play golf with him. And everything Trump does, no matter how bad it is, Lindsey Graham supports him. Graham had a position to take with these four girls, these four young congresswomen. He called them communists. Communists. I haven't heard that term applied to anybody in this country since the late 1980s, early 1990s. He's out of his mind. Sure, they're progressive. They may be socialists. Nothing wrong with that. Many great countries like Norway, Sweden, they're socialistic countries. The government provides everything. You pay high taxes and the government takes care of you. They may be socialists. They are socialists. That doesn't make them communists. And that was wrong for him to do, and I'm shocked. And I don't consider him the great man I, I did um, before he took this position. Anyhow, that's the show for tonight. I hope you enjoyed. I love doing the show. I, I hope you love hearing it. It must be because my numbers get bigger every week. I do a blog every morning, uh, keywestlu.com. It's like the show, but it's in writing. You may want to read it. I know you'll enjoy it. If you enjoy the show, you'll enjoy my blog. It's longer, more issues entertain. KeyWestLou.com. Give it a shot for no other reason than I think you will enjoy it. I already ha I have 60,000 subscribers. I started doing this 13 years ago, this blog. Never promoted it. I'm promoting it right now because it's so good I want people to read it. That's the story. My time is over. 
Good night. Talk with you next week.